Hi, Rachel. Hi. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. It's a Monday morning, so <laughs> getting ready for the week. <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit about you. Where are you from and where do you live now? Yeah, so I'm from Massachusetts. I was born and raised there. And then I moved to New Hampshire when I met my husband. Um, we both went to college together in New Hampshire. And so after that, we just stayed here and bought a house, got married. And so that's where I'm at now. What part of New Hampshire? Southern New Hampshire. Okay. What's like the weather there now? Is it getting cold? Yeah, it's like freezing. It's been like 40 degrees at night. Um, during the day, it goes up to like 80 sometimes though. So you kind of have to start your day with just lots of layers on and just take them off <laughs> as the day goes on and then put them back on as the sun goes down. It's been like that here too in Colorado a little bit, probably not as intense, but it mm -hmm. the, this part of the year is so funny because of that. It's like, I'm freezing in the morning wearing a winter coat and then <laughs> in the middle yes. of the I'm like, I have to wear shorts now. I don't know. It's weird. Yep. <laughs> so what do you do for work? Um, so I'm a graphic designer full time. So I work for a company that's a restaurant company. They have multiple different brands. And okay. so anytime they need menus or posters or stuff for their website, that's kind of what I do. Oh, that's amazing. Graphic designer. Yeah. That's like a skill set I do not have. So I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate that a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. You're very like artistic. Yes. Well, I'm not very good with like freehand stuff like drawing or painting or sketching, but digitally that's kind of where I, where I resign. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about your diagnosis story. Yeah. So I was diagnosed at 19 years old. So that was 2008. And it was the summer going in to my sophomore year of college. And so symptoms started showing when I was still in school, like ending my freshman year, mm -hmm. I had, you know, I was falling asleep in class. I was super thirsty. I had the cotton mouth um, and then peeing a lot. And it wasn't until I went home from like from college into my summer break that my mom started seeing me doing all these things. And she was like, something seems a little off. You probably, probably want to go to the doctors, get it checked out. It, she even said, she was like, this looks like diabetes. And I was like, no, I think I'm just depressed. And because I was sleeping all the time. And so I ended up going to the doctors and I called them and on the phone, I was like, yeah, I'm making this appointment because, you know, I think I'm depressed, but my mom thinks it's diabetes. And so they were like, okay, come on in. And they saw me pretty quickly. I got in within like, maybe even that day. I, I don't, I remember I didn't have to wait that long. And I go in, she pricks my finger and she was like, all right, it's just reading high. So we're going to send this to the lab down the hall, but you definitely have diabetes. And I was like, oh, okay. And it didn't really hit me at first. I don't know if I was just in shock. I was just kind of okay with it. I was just like, all right, whatever. She came back and she was like, yeah, your sugar's 746. This is definitely type one diabetes. And she was our family doctor. So she was like, do you want to call your mom? And I was like, yeah. So I called my mom. And then that was when I lost it. That's when I just broke down in tears. She came into the office. The doctor kind of explained just like loosely, like what everything was. And she gave me like a loose insulin to carb ratio. And she sent me home with Lantus. And I remember when she was injecting me in the office, she was like, all right, we're going to do an injection in your stomach. And she lifted up my shirt, but there was nothing to grab. There was no fat because I had lost so much weight. She was like, all right, let's do it in the leg. And so she shot me in the leg and sent me home. And I think it was about two weeks until, no, not two weeks, two months until I could find an endo. And then just kind of started the journey from there. Oh my gosh. So did you even know what diabetes was when they told you that? Yeah. So my dad has type one as well. And so I don't know if maybe the, one of the reasons I probably didn't freak out was because I saw him living with it. And so it just didn't super freak me out just because I saw him doing all the things that he was did and he didn't let it slow him down. So I was just like, oh, okay. Or maybe I was in shock, but. Do you have any like siblings in your family? Yeah. Yep. I have three brothers Do any and I'm the only one that has it. Okay. Wow. That's interesting. Cause I hear, you know, if it runs in your dad's side of the family, you have a higher chance. Right. Every time I interview somebody that, that usually is the case, it's like on their dad's side. And that's even, yeah. that's even weird because my, my dad's side of the family, nobody has type one, but we have a ton of autoimmune diseases in that, on that side. So I'm like, what is it about like the paternal side that makes us get it? But that's crazy. 
I know it's so bizarre. And his, it, what's actually strange is that my dad's grandmother had it. So his grandmother had it, then he had it. And then I got it. So it's very, it's strange, but I know that according to the stats, cause I was looking at it before I got pregnant that like, you know, if you're a woman, it's not as likely to pass down. And then if you're of a certain age, you're not as likely. So just like kind of all these things make it less likely or more likely depending on, you know, your gender or, you know, the age you get diagnosed or the age you get pregnant. So it is strange that the grandmother had it and then my dad had it and now I have it, but yeah, it's like going girl, boy, girl, boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So were you sick at all before? Like, did it come from a virus, do you think? So I had gotten the hepatitis B vaccine and the HPV vaccine like a few months prior. And what actually happened is I was supposed to get the HPV vaccine. And when I went in, I got the vaccine. By the time I got home, I had a message in my voicemail saying, we accidentally gave you the wrong shot. We gave you hepatitis B by accident. We need you to come back in and get the HPV. And so I went back in, got the HPV. And then that's kind of like within, it was shortly after, it must've been like two months or three months that then the symptoms started showing. And so the way that my doctor explained it was anything that activates your immune system, if you carry that gene can trigger it on. So whether it's, you know, vaccine induced or you catch a virus, just anything that activates that immune system can have the possibility to turn that, even if it was to be dormant, you know, the whole life, but it just oh turns out. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Awful. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, I don't know, you probably could have like sued them for that. No, like giving you the wrong vaccine. I know. I know. And what's funny is I had looked into it like years later and because someone had said that to me, someone was like, I'm sure you could, you know, figure out something like to get reimbursed for that or compensated. And I, I don't know if when I looked into it, it had like already reached the statute of limitations for like how long it had been. Mm -hmm. Because as, at that point, when I looked back, because I've had it for 15 years now. So I want to say maybe the statute was like 10 years or I don't know, it was something I was like, whatever, go figure <laughs> Oh my but God, yeah, that's crazy. crazy. Yeah. Oh, that's awful too. Cause that, I mean, it probably would have happened at some point, but still it's like if right. they triggered it, that's terrible. Right. Well, and I should have known too, because when I went in for the HPV vaccine, she had said, oh, so you're here to get the hepatitis B. And I said, no, HPV. And she goes, oh yes, right. HPV. And then she said it one more time where she was like, all right, we're going to give the hep B. And I'm like, no, 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 it's HPV. So I should have known like, cause I already had a corrector multiple times. Oh, and then I got that voicemail and I'm like, are you kidding me? But at the time I, I was like, whatever, like, you know, like it's not a big deal. Like I didn't think it would have triggered type one, but oh my God. like you said, I'm sure anything, you know, if I had gotten a virus or a cold or anything like that, I mean, yeah, who it's knows? Interesting. Cause you were on the older side when you were diagnosed. Right. So I'm right. sorry because it runs in your family that it didn't happen earlier even. Right. I know that makes me think that it was probably supposed to be dormant in me. And then just epigenetics, you know, something in my environment just caused it to turn on and boom. How old was your dad when he was diagnosed? He was later in life too. He was 30. Oh. He had gotten, his was turned on by a virus. I don't know if he had the flu or he had something, but he remembers being sick with something and then the symptoms started. And then I don't know about his grandmother. Were you born before he was diagnosed or after? I think it was the same year. So oh he was God. diagnosed when he was 30 and I was born when he was 30. So I don't know. I was born in April. So I don't know when in the year he got to his diagnosis. Yeah. That's just, that's all very interesting how it works. I know. Wow. I'm sorry. Yeah. So what do you, how do you manage it now? What technology do you use? Yeah. So when, well, when I had first started, I was just MDI and finger pricks. And then I decided to get on a pump when I wanted to get pregnant, just because I was like, this is going to offer a lot more control. I was super hesitant about it though, because I had been MDI for so long. I just didn't like giving up that control. Then when I went on MD, uh, then when I went on a pump, I was like, holy cow, I wish I did this sooner. Like it was just amazing. And I'm on the Omnipod. I'm still using their classic, which is like their original one I'm not on the five or the dash and then for my CGM I use the Libre okay GYC. I was using Dexcom but first of all the the plunger like insertion just really intimidated me I always had to have my husband do it yeah. and I just found that it wasn't super accurate like every time I would 
prick my finger, it was always way off. It was like 50 to 80 points off. And so I was using the CGM and finger pricks at the same time. And so it was kind of like, you know, I was still pricking myself 10 to 12 times a day. And then when I switched to the Libre, I don't even know why I made the switch. I think I just wanted to try it out. It was so accurate for me that I didn't even have to do finger pricks anymore. And so I went from doing like 10 to 12 finger pricks a day to doing like zero. And so like even before making insulin decisions, I didn't have to prick myself because it was always within 10 points off. Wow. on. It's a lot less expensive. I, yeah. I was gonna say, I've heard great things about the Libre. Actually that it's accurate. And yeah. you can get like three or four in the same price as one Dexcom or something. Right. Yeah. And they last longer. They last 14 days and you only have one piece of tech that you're working with. You're not working with the sensor and the transmitter. It's just the sensor. And it's smaller too, I think. Way smaller. Yeah. So the, so I, I have kind of a mix of all the Libres just because I stocked up and so I have the original Libres, then I have the Libre 3. And so the Libre 3 is like the size of a penny. It's so small. That's great. And it's continuous too now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the Libre 3 is, yeah. The okay. original one, you only get readings when you scan your receiver to it. Uh -huh. But the Libre 3, yeah, it's continuous, just like the Dexcom. So you'll get alerts, you get alarms, you get all that stuff. And it's like an app as well? Yep. You Okay. I'm like, maybe I should look into that. I, I was just immediately yeah. put on Dexcom. So I'm like, I know nothing else, but yeah. Yeah. That's how I was. And I'm so happy that I went to the Libre and then now I'm switching to the Omnipod five soon. I think next year is when my original supplies run out and then I'll switch to the five and that only talks with Dexcom right now. So yeah. I'm like, Ooh, do I get on the Dexcom just for that? Or do I just hold, because I know that they're working with Libre to have like that integrated system. So I'm like, how long can I wait out <laughs> until they like get FDA approval and, and all that? Yeah. And that's, I'm surprised Dexcom wasn't accurate for you. Sometimes mine isn't, and I'll have to calibrate it a couple of times, but most yeah. of the time it is pretty accurate. So that's interesting. Yeah. It's so bizarre. And, and during pregnancy, it was a pain because you just have like those crazy swings. So it's, I couldn't really trust it that much. Like I, I could use it for the trends, like if I was going up or going down, but as far as like bolusing off of it, I just didn't feel comfortable doing that without a finger stick. But this was, this was back, I think I was using the Dexcom 4 at the time. So it was, this was a while ago. So accuracy has improved since then, but at that time, it just wasn't working for me. So you were on Omnipod and Dexcom when you were pregnant? Yep. Did you have only one kid? Yep. He's five oh. now. <laughs> oh, how was, how was pregnancy with type one? It wasn't too bad. The first trimester, I had a lot of lows. Mm -hmm. The second trimester was pretty, I mean, I, I say smooth sailing, but it, it was just a constant increase of resistance. So I kind of knew what to expect. And then the third trimester, same thing. It was just a steady rise. The craziest part for me was postpartum. Mm -hmm. It was the hardest part just because I don't know if it was that I was depleted of all these minerals and nutrients that my insulin just couldn't work as well. Like I was very resistant and then just your hormones fluctuating after pregnancy. Like that was the hardest time because at least with pregnancy, I could anticipate that it was just steady resistance, but postpartum, it was like up and down and in between and you couldn't really predict it. And, and that was the hardest part. Yeah. I can't even imagine. That sounds crazy. I'm like diabetes itself is like that and yeah. thrown in like all the other hormone issues. Oh my gosh. Right. <laughs> I know. I expected pregnancy to be a lot harder and, and maybe it is for some people, but for me, it was just like, just a steady rise up. So I could just at least bank on that. Like that was my anchor. I was like, well, if I have issues, I'm always increasing, yeah. but just the unknown with postpartum where it was like, I didn't know if my insulin was going to work really well for that sandwich that I was about to eat, or if it was going to be like I was injecting water. So that was the tricky part. Yeah. I, I talked to somebody else who said they had like to pre-bolus like way earlier than normal, like 45 minutes. Was that the case for you too? Yeah, totally. During pregnancy and my endo had explained that during pregnancy, your digestion slows way down and just everything kind of slows down a lot. That's how she like explained why the insulin wasn't working as well, just because everything was kind of slower. But yeah, I had to pre-bolus like 40 minutes before if I was going to do like a big meal. But I did a lot of low carb during pregnancy just because I found that was easier. And I just, I had this fear of insulin. Like I didn't want to 
inject, you know, seven units for an apple. That just scared the heck out of me. So I, I did keep it low carb. I wasn't keto throughout pregnancy, but definitely low carb. I feel like I would also do low carb. I mean, I don't, I've never been pregnant, so I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> I feel like, I mean, I understand you have to have carbs to like keep the baby healthy, but you don't need to be like right. eating pizza every night necessarily. Right. Well, and that's what some of the people, when I'd go in for my endos appointments, they were like, you need to eat more carbs and you need to be having, you know, 50 to 70 grams of carbs per meal. I'm like, I, I can't make that work. <laughs> I can't make that work and stay in range during pregnancy. Like, nope. <laughs> well, and I found too, like the only way for me to get that many carbs was to eat a lot of processed junk. Like if I'm just eating sweet potatoes and squashes and, you know, some bread here and there, like it was in fruit, but it's pretty hard to get above 20 to 30 carbs per meal when you're eating like that. Like I'd have to throw in so much pasta and just junk. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to do that just to hit this random number of carbs that they're telling me I need. Yeah. And then you have to worry five hours later, your blood sugar is going right. through the roof and like, uh, you're sleeping or like whatever the case is. It's just, that's awful. And on yep. your Omnipod, that's, it wasn't an automatic system, right? You would have to. Right. Yeah. So I just still like go in and tell it to bolus for me and, yeah. and make like little nudges here and there. And yeah, I'm on MDI. And that's my one complaint is like, if I start to go high, I have to manually give myself insulin. Mm -hmm. So that's like the one reason I would maybe want to go in a pump, but I do love MDI. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. MDI is nice because you do have that freedom and you don't have anything attached to you. But yeah, doing those little bump and nudges on the Omnipod is so nice. And then even just setting the temp basal, like if I'm, if I'm in my second half of my cycle, like ovulation to my period, I just run like this temp basal just because I need more insulin. So it's just so much easier to just click a button and say, you know, give me 40% more, 50% more background insulin throughout the whole day. And it just, it's so much easier to manage that time. That sounds very nice. I don't know. Maybe I'll be convinced one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is your like go-to low snack? Well, it depends on where I'm at. If I'm at the house, I like to do orange juice just because it's, it hits fast. And the faster I get rid of that low feeling, the less I am to over-treat it. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm out on a walk, I really like these, I think they're called solely fruit jerkies. It's just like a dehydrated mango and it's super thin, but it packs like 30 grams of carbs per strip. Oh, wow. So that's really good. And then by my bedside table, I have maple syrup packets and honey packets <sighs> because it's just like this fast hit of glucose. It's super small, super discreet. I don't have to chew anything in the middle of the night. I just squeeze it in my mouth and go back to bed. <laughs> That's a great idea. Cause I have glucose tablets right by my bed and like automatically in the middle of the night, I just like pop in my mouth, go back to sleep. I'll wake up with like, like so much like nasty sugar in my mouth because of, <laughs> so I'm like, I need another option that like, I don't have to like chew because it's just like, which is really gross, but <laughs> yeah, you wake up with like powder lips and <laughs> chalk, chalk yeah. mouth. The maple syrup packets are awesome. And it's funny because my son loves them. So he's often going into like the center console of my car or like in my nightstand drawer and he's just ripping them open and, and having them himself because it's just pure maple syrup or pure honey. So it's super tasty. Yeah, that's awesome. And because you just brought up your son, do you have any like concern that he will get type one? Not really. And I think it's just because first of all, I know what to look for. So yeah. like, I know the symptoms right away. Um, so that kind of makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. And then also to just those stats that I come across where it was like, you know, if you're over this age, when you get pregnant, or if you're over this age, when you're diagnosed and just being a woman and all that stuff, the risk is pretty low. So I just, I don't worry about it too much. Yeah. I mean, obviously we hope we, he doesn't ever get it, but it sounds like it's, it kind of runs in your family at an older age. So even if he were to hopefully it would be you know when he right. can manage it on his own hopefully. yeah totally. obviously we don't want him to get it but <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we don't definitely don't want that but yeah if I, I can't imagine these I see these families who have children like young children who get it and I'm like I can barely you know manage to keep him still for five minutes let alone trying to manage diabetes in him like that would just be you know props to all those parents and all those kids too who go through it because 
that has to be so much. I did a diabetes camp for little kids. I was a counselor and I was there mm -hmm. for three days and it was the hardest three days I think I've ever done. So I was like, I can't imagine because their, their blood sugars are going to 300, to 75, to 250, to 70, like back and forth. And I'm just like, I can't, I can't even do this. I know. I feel like it's a whole different ball game too, because I feel like they're so sensitive to insulin. Like I think I've heard that they have to use even like a really diluted insulin or, or their ratios are just super, super low just because it just hits them so hard. Yeah. And they don't, you know, they don't do any of the pre bolusing or any like, cause they're little kids. They're just like excited and it's just so right. hard to manage. So yeah. God bless all those parents out there. Yeah. But do you have any like blood sugar friendly recipes that you like to make? Yeah. So I, I came across this book, Glucose Goddess by huh. Jessie. I can't even pronounce her last name. Right. But she kind of introduced me to this idea of pairing everything with like a protein and a fat and then carbs. And so I've really changed a lot of how we eat now to include a lot of protein fats, and then carbs. So on my website, I have a bunch of recipes that I share. You could sit down and eat a bowl of mac and cheese and that's fine for dinner, but your blood sugar, it's just going to be a fight with that. So just even something as simple as like throwing in hot dogs into that mac and cheese or adding like a starter salad or something like that. So I, I just make sure when I do these recipes that I have a good balance of all those macros so that even if you forget to pre-bolus or, or whatever, you still have the help of that extra fat, that extra protein. So it's not, you know, shooting you into the stars the minute you start eating it. Yeah. That's funny you brought her up because I just recently found out about her and I listened to some podcasts where she talks about blood sugar and it's mm -hmm. awesome. She gives some great tips for well, one type one diabetics, but just people in general. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I eat a lot of protein too. So that's great. And I'm going to have to check out your recipes though. Cause I never know what to make. I'm always just like making the same thing for dinner. <laughs> so I'm going to look at your recipe. Yeah. What's really helped us too is meal planning. So like at the start of each week, I kind of write down what we're going to do for dinner every night. That way I can plan ahead. So then my boluses are, you know, I can just plan it better with my insulin but then also too, just, you don't have that last minute scramble of, you know, what am I making for dinner? Oh, I just have this in the fridge. Okay. This is what we're getting. Cause when you plan, then you just have more time to think, okay, well, what's the protein I'm going to add to this? What's the veggie I'm going to add to this. And just the less that you have to think about it in the moment, just for us, the smoother it goes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is such a good tip because I, if I scramble, like if I'm hungry and I'm just like, I need to make something, I end up eating like crap. Yeah. It's always the carbs that yeah. you go for. <laughs> <laughs> always and I'm like I should meal prep <laughs> which yep. I actually did this week but only for like a few lunches so but may I need mm -hmm. to do that for the whole week like write down what we're gonna eat that'd be great yeah I mostly just focus on dinner because then my lunch is usually just leftovers and then for breakfast we kind of always do the same thing we always do some kind of egg with some kind of breakfast meat and then some kind of you know little fruit or fruit smoothie or something with like a protein powder in it so mm -hmm. breakfast is always the same for us so I never plan that but yeah just the dinners and then lunches can be leftovers it's you really only have to plan just that one meal and it stretches through the whole the whole week that's great <laughs> I will be looking at your website after this for sure <laughs> so what do you think type 1 diabetes will look like in five to ten years I try, honestly, I try not to think about it <laughs> because I'm like, there's just this, I, like, I don't know if you were told this story when you first got diagnosed, but they're always like, yeah, there'll be a cure in five to 10 years. Don't you worry. And, and so you kind of bank on that. And then, you know, five years goes by, 10 years goes by and you're like, okay, I do think that there'll be a lot more automated stuff on the market. Cause it just seems like that's where everything is going. And I'm hoping that there's more tubeless pumps on the market too, because I think it's crazy that there's only one, but yeah, I definitely see more integration for sure. I hear Tandem is working on a tubeless pump or they're, they're working on it. I don't know where they're at with that, but I know somebody that works for Tandem and then she told me that. So I don't know if I'm allowed saying that, but I am. So that would be awesome. Coming. Yeah. And then I hear, I hear Medtronic is also coming out with something like new, like really new and improved. So yes, let's hope like, if not a cure, that something that's so simple that we don't have to think about it too much. Yeah, great. that would be awesome. Any tips for somebody that's newly diagnosed? Yeah, I would say just just pay attention to not just your endocrine system, but all the other systems in your body, because I found that especially postpartum, just having nutrient deficiencies, 
made my insulin not work as well as it should. And it made me very resistant. And then once I addressed those mineral deficiencies, then I needed way less insulin. It was working the way that it should. It was working faster. And then even something like exercise, just exercising every day, putting on muscle, not just doing cardio, but putting on muscle as well, not just focusing on just the diabetes, but almost like just focusing on whole body health that will just improve everything. It makes every system in your body work better. It makes your insulin work better. It just fixes everything. It doesn't fix everything, but it just makes it all work a lot smoother. Oh, totally. Yeah. That was, that's great advice. So how do people find you and how do they get to your website? So they can find me at t1dliving.com. And then from there, you can find my Facebook page, my Instagram page and everything else. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.